يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عبس وتولى أن جاءه الأعمى وما يدريك لعله يزكى أو يذكر فتنفعه الذكرى أما من استغنى فأنت له تصدى وما عليك ألا يزكى وأما من جاءك يسعى وهو يخشى فأنت عنه تلهى رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين Today's khutbah starts with recalling an incident in the life of our messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is of unique importance and importance enough that the the a first passage of a very profound surah of the Quran is dedicated to that incident to help us better understand that incident. And this involves the Prophet ﷺ trying to deliver the message of Islam to the leaders of Quraysh. This is something he was struggling to do for a very long time. It's important to note that Allah sent all of His messengers to different towns across the world, across history, but one of the goals that they all had was to actually speak to the very top of the society. Like Musa salam was told first and foremost to go speak to the Pharaoh, to Fir'aun and then the rest of the nation. And there is a reason for that, because the people of the highest influence, if they were to accept Islam, then that would have a ripple effect. A lot of more people would be influenced by their decision, and it would actually spread Islam much, much faster. This is the same reason why Rasulullah used to make dua for either Umar bin al-Khattab or Amr, which is Abu Jahl, to accept Islam, because these are people of influence. This is even true today, when you find out somebody, some celebrity wore a hijab or held a Quran, or you know the rumor that somebody's president. People love the rumor that you know Barack Obama is president or whatever. Or he's was Muslim now, you know. So when when we, we people hear these things, they feel like you know what? Now we've got a big deal on a, you know a big gun on our side. Somebody who's going to help you know better the image of Islam, etc. I mean, even just think in our contemporary life about the kind of impact that a personality like Muhammad Ali had, you know, and his Islam had, and what, how many people found confidence in their faith, rallying behind such a personality. So this is in a sense natural. But the thing is, with the Prophet ﷺ, most of his career, the leaders of Quraysh were adamantly against anything he had to say. And the Qur'an will describe through the example of other prophets and other struggles, that one of the reasons they didn't want to hear anything the Prophet had to say, even though note that the Prophet ﷺ himself is from an elite family. He's from the family of Hashim. So he actually is a member of the elite in that sense, even though he's an orphan and he doesn't have the kind of wealth and background, but from a tribal point of view, he does belong to a higher status family. Even then, what the Qur'an will describe is different reasons why the, the higher ups in society, whether they're politically influential, financially influential, socially influential, the reason they don't want to hear anything the prophets have to say, one of them is they see that people around the prophets are very poor. They've got slaves around them, they've got youth that don't have any ser serious influence around them, they've got the impoverished around them, and they say, I don't want to come and talk to you, in this poor neighborhood and hang around these people. If you want to speak to me, let me just come to my place or come to some elite setting where I don't have to see this scum of society because they, they, they feel that this is beneath them, right? Like if some governor or some, some mayor today or some billionaire gave you time of day, it's probably you're going to go to his office. He's not going to come to the corner coffee shop near your neighborhood, you know, that's not going to happen. So they want, to, they want you to come on their terms. And so, but the prophets, all of them spoke to all of society. They did not develop a class system, even though the, the, you know, the prophets were to address the elite, that doesn't mean that they didn't care about everybody else. They gave the message equally to everyone. So on one rare occasion, what happens is one of the leaders of Quraysh, and it's interesting to note, we're not sure who it is. Different Sahaba have different opinions about who it is. It could have been Utbah, it could have been Abu Jahal, it could have been any number of them. Okay? So lots of opinions are found about who that might have been. Or was it a number of them? Were they Sanadidu Quraysh? Were there a number of the leaders that he was talking to? Anyway, at one occasion, instead of making fun of the Prophet or والسلام, or debating with him or dismissing him, it's one of those rare cases where they're actually listening to him. So he's speaking with them outside and they're actually listening. And they're engaged in this conversation. And while they're engaged in this conversation, one of the relatives of the Prophet ﷺ, whose name is Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, you can remember him for short as Abdullah, that'll be easy for you to remember, right? He's related to the Prophet ﷺ by marriage, so he's cousins with Khadija radiallahu anha. 
and he's very, he's very poor man, uh, and he's one of the earliest people to accept Islam. This is all happening in Mecca. He happened to be passing by, and an important thing about Abdullah is that he's blind. So he, he's, he's, he, doesn't, he can't see. And he's passing by, and he, of course, when people are blind, then they have much higher sensitive hearing. Their other senses are sharpened even more. So from kind of a distance, he hears the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. There's no other way for him to know where the Prophet is, except by his voice. And as I told you, the Prophet is at this time ﷺ, engaged in a rare opportunity. He's talking to the leaders of Quraysh, and they're actually listening for a change. And so he's in the middle of this conversation, and he comes rushing over to the Messenger ﷺ, who happens to be his cousin also. And it's interesting, in one narration he says, Ya Muhammad arshidni, Muhammad, give me some guidance, tell me something good. You know, and he didn't say Ya Rasulullah, he said Ya Muhammad. And that may be the case because they're family. And it's still early on in the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ. And other instructions like you don't address him that way, you call him Rasulullah. Those are later instructions, right? So anyway, he comes to him in one narration and says, Arshidni, just give me some guidance. In another narration, he says, Alimni mimma allamaka Allah. Teach me something that Allah taught you. Teach me out of the many things Allah has taught you, give me something good. Now this is, analyze what he's saying. He's not saying that I have an emergency and I need help right away. He's not saying that I have a situation, I need your urgent advice. He just happened to hear the Prophet's voice, he got excited, he you know, rushed over to the Prophet and said, can you tell me something good please? Could you, I just really want to hear something motivating, something spiritual. That's, that's what he's saying. But the Prophet ﷺ is right now engaged in another conversation. He's already talking to somebody who he may never get a chance to talk to again. And even if he does, that opportunity may not be the same because for a change they're actually listening. So now the Prophet ﷺ is stuck. He doesn't want to break Abdullah's heart and say, could you hold on a second, let me finish this conversation. And he doesn't want to lose the chance of speaking to this leader also. So what the Prophet ﷺ does is something completely ingenious. He, as he's in this tension, he turns slightly to the leader that he was speaking to, and he says to him, هَلْ تَرَى بِمَا أَقُولُ بَأْسًا Do you see any problem in what I've been sharing with you? So he didn't really respond to Abdullah yet. He talked to the leader of Quraysh and said, Hey, so I've been talking to you for a while. Anything I've said so far, do you have any problem with it? Basically. Now why did he do that? One, it solves the problem for Abdullah. Abdullah now realizes, wait, I'm interrupting a conversation. I didn't realize I was interrupting a conversation. And at that point, Abdullah's reaction is supposed to be, Rasulullah, I didn't realize you're talking to somebody else, I just got excited. Why don't you just finish your conversation, I'll ask you later. My thing is not urgent, it can wait. So the Prophet wouldn't have to tell him, you need to wait, just give me a couple of seconds, because that might be hurtful to him. But he tried to tell him in a very indirect and polite way. At the same time, he's trying to get to the leader of Quraysh and saying, listen, uh, I'm not dismissing you, so don't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, so he's kind of trying to mitigate both of these situations, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa now, the other thing I want to share with you is scholars like Al Qurtubi, Imam Razi, others, when they talk about this, uh, this incident, they at length describe what Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum did wrong. Like I said, if he's blind, certainly it's an indication in the story that he's got very sharp hearing. And if he's got sharp hearing, not only did he hear the Prophet, ﷺ, he also heard the other that was speaking. And the other that was speaking, whoever it was, definitely was a famous person in Mecca. It's a, it's a leader. It's a millionaire, it's somebody's big deal. Which means Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, high chances are, also recognized who that was. But he still didn't regard that. It's just, because to him, the Prophet ﷺ is not only the messenger, it's also his relative. And he just got excited and interrupted the conversation. So the first wrong that was done, was actually done by Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. Like if two of you are talking, and I interrupt the conversation, and say salam to one of you, and pretend the other one doesn't even exist, and just start talking, that's rude. I've done something rude. I should at the very least apologize, I'm sorry for the interruption, can I just borrow you for one second, something, say, acknowledge both. At the very least, acknowledge both. Also, when the elite sees that he hasn't been acknowledged, right, the Prophet got acknowledged, but the other guy in the conversation was not acknowledged. He's gonna be offended, like he's used to being acknowledged. He's a big deal. And, the, and that diminishes the chances of him now listening more attentively or that, that, that golden opportunity to give him something good is now slipping away. But on the other hand, also understand something else. Understand that people like Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum are very excited and truly, truly motivated to learn something beneficial. You may not see it as a state of emergency, 
But for them, learning anything of benefit, is, they're so eager to learn it and they're so excited about it. When he hears the Prophet's voice وسلم, he's so excited that he forgets everything else. He forgets what other sounds he hears. He forgets everything else that's going on. He just really wants to learn something of benefit. And this is an incredible, incredible sentiment that Allah put inside the heart of a believer that they're so excited and eager to learn something of benefit, you know. So yes, it was socially awkward. Yes, it was something that's not quite polite. But actually from another point of view, you have to understand the emotion and the excitement from which he is speaking. This is the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he has the highest example. But I do want to share with you so you can, you can appreciate, you know, to some extent how this stuff even happens today. Sometimes I'm traveling to a, in, a, in a conference somewhere and you know, I'm walking through the bazaar trying to find something to buy for my kids or something and somebody recognizes me and they start talking to me. Now we're having a conversation and they say, I have this serious problem I wanted to talk to you about. I wonder if you can give me some advice. And we're having a conversation and in the middle of the conversation, I get grabbed and hugged. Assalamu alaikum, I've seen so many of your videos. And now they're talking to me and what's happened is the first person I was speaking to feels like I completely dismissed them. Like they don't exist anymore. And this person didn't say salam to both, he just said salam to me. Now on the one hand you could think they're being rude, but let me tell you, they're just excited. They may have heard a thousand hours of me talking to them, that they feel like they know me. Like I, I play in their head before they go to sleep, for a lot of people, <laughs> you know. So they feel like they have a personal connection with me. I may not know them, but I have to at least be sensitive to their excitement. But that still doesn't mean that the other person who feels dismissed, it's okay for them to feel that way. It's a difficult situation to be in. Either way, I'm in trouble. Either way. If I told this one person, could you just wait one second, I'm going to finish this conversation, then I'll come right back to you. If I said that much, this guy will say, I listened to him for a thousand hours. I gave so many, so many sleep, sleep, sleepy nights to him. And the first thing he ever says to me is, wait a second. You know, I'm never, talk I'm never listening to him again. What a rude person. This is a, it's a sensitive situation. It's a delicate situation. So the Prophet ﷺ, in this tense moment, here's what he did. He, to try to figure out what's going on, the verb for it is abas. Abasa means qattaba bayna aynayhi, to show a bulge between both eyes, like this much. Like just this bulge between the eyes. If it goes a little further, if you start showing lines on the forehead and your teeth start grinding like you're frustrated, that's called kalah. And if you're so frustrated that you do something obnoxious on top of that, that's actually called basar with a scene, like abasa wa basar, right? The least demonstration of being tense, being frustrated on your face is abasa. The surah begins abasa wa tawalla. He frowned and he turned away. The Prophet ﷺ showed that frustration on his face and he turned away. Now the question arises, who did he frown at? He didn't frown at anyone, he frowned at the situation. That's why Allah doesn't even mention that he frowned at a person. That's not the reason. And that's the rationale is coming a little later. But the other thing is, if you were watching this, just imagine for a second, there's a governor that the Prophet is talking to. Everybody knows the governor. And there's some blind guy. Who is the, who's the one that everybody recognizes? The governor. And if you saw the Prophet turning towards the governor, the journalist would write down, he turned towards the governor. Nobody's going to write down, he turned away from the blind guy. In other words, by saying the words Abasa wa Tawalla, Allah actually acknowledged the blind one and completely dismissed the governor. Like to Allah, the VIP is the other one. <laughs> it's not this one. Because you know, it would be news if the Prophet turned away, if Musa turned away from the Pharaoh. He turned away from the king? How, do, how did he do that? He defied the king like that? He made a face at the king? But Allah Azza wa is describing the Prophet's frustration and his even slightest of turning towards this leader of Quraysh and records it. And the even more incredible thing is when Quran is revealed to the Prophet because they say, فَنَزَلَتْ At the very moment where the Prophet said, Do you see a problem with what I've shared with you so far? At the very moment these ayat were revealed to the Prophet And when the ayat are revealed to the Prophet he doesn't keep them to himself. He what? He recites them out loud. So there's two people in front of him, this blind person and this leader, and in front of both of them, the Prophet is saying, he frowned and he turned away. Like he's critiquing himself in front of them. It's an incredible moment. And then Allah says, أَنْ جَاءَهُ الْأَعْمَى That the blind one had come to him. 
the blind one had come to him. Now Allah could have named him. And some might say, you calling this guy, hey, blind guy, that means it's an insult. Right? That's a condescending to call somebody blind, blind. Or to call somebody deaf, deaf. You know? And so, why did Allah call him the blind one? The way to look at this is, Allah Azza wa is acknowledging that this man has a, a visual impairment. He's disabled. And despite being disabled, he sought you out. He should get extra courtesy from you. Other people who are in perfectly good health and even have wealth, you're running after them and they don't give you time of day. And this one, it's so much harder for him to make the effort to even reach you and he comes all the way to you despite the fact that he's blind. His blindness actually became kind of a gold medal for him. Like Allah acknowledging the effort and the struggle that it took for him to come to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi there's something else here. Through, the, through acknowledging the struggle of this blind individual, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, Allah is actually acknowledging the additional struggle all people with any disability have to make when they try to learn this deen or when they go about in life. They don't have the same access as everybody else. The person sitting in a wheelchair is all the way in the back of Jum'ah. And everybody gets to run over to the Imam or the Khatib and ask their question and he can't roll over people he's sitting in the back. Somebody who's blind, somebody who has his heart of hearing, they have less access than everybody else. They have special side accommodations, if any, than anybody else. Children with special needs, the same thing. So the people that have disabilities, they get dismissed easily. They get forgotten easily. They're considered less important easily. As a matter of fact, if you saw this, if this got recorded and it's on YouTube or whatever, and it says a khutbah for the disabled, most people won't even click it. Why not? It's not for me. Maybe I'll forward it to somebody who is disabled because that's not my problem. You see? They're not, we don't acknowledge these people. We dismiss them quite easily. We don't talk about them and we don't consider them. Anja'ahul a'ma is Allah acknowledging the one with disability and actually telling the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that even the slightest bit of, well, he wasn't even dismissing him yet, but the standards are so high. This is how sensitive you're supposed to be as the Messenger of Allah to set the example of how careful you must be around these VIPs of Allah. These are very important people to Allah. Do you know, I'm not even done with the story yet, but I'll tell you one, I'll fast forward to one part of this story. Later on in the life of the Messenger والسلام, every time Abdullah came by, every time this man came by, marhaban, marhaban bihi, marhaban biman atabani Allahu bihi, congratulations, you know, I, I welcome the one, Allah, I got in trouble with Allah because of you. I gotta be extra careful with you. And he was, saying it, he was saying it jokingly, every time he came, he would actually stop everything he was doing, sallallahu alayhi wa and he would say, you know, hal ilayka bi haja, do you have any need at all? Anything you need at all? Can I get you anything? Any, anything at all? And he would like go out of his way to ask him. And as he would leave a gathering, he'd do that again. Ask him again, everything okay, everything okay, everything okay, why? Because by the end of this passage, you know what Allah said? Allah said to the messenger, fa'anta anhu talaha. And you, Messenger of Allah, you get to be distracted from him? How did you get distracted from him? And this is actually something the Messenger lived his entire life. He was never distracted from Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum again. Any gathering he came to, he gave him special time and attention. Because Allah went out of his way to say, فَأَنْتَ anhu talaha." You know, those of you that study Arabic, talaha anhu, or actually, tatalaha anhu. But this is a taqdeem here, anta anhu. Talaha, Talaha even saying, are you even the least bit distracted from him? You're not even allowed that much. And then what Allah does in this passage, one of, one of my, the, a few favorite things about this passage, is there were two individuals in, in front of the Prophet, a governor, a leader, and this individual. Allah started the surah by saying, this individual is so elite in his status, that when the Prophet ﷺ does not give him the proper courtesy that is required to him by Allah's standards. By the Prophet's standards, he did nothing wrong. Understand that. Even if the Prophet was frustrated just a little bit and there was a frown on his face, can a blind person see a frown? Even if the Prophet turned his face this way and talked to the leader of Quraysh, can the, can the blind person see him turning his face? He can't. He didn't hurt his feelings. But by Allah's standards, even that's too much. Because somebody watching from a distance, Somebody seeing this incident from a hundred feet away might think, oh, the Prophet thinks that the, the governor is more important and the blind one is less important. You can't even afford to give that impression. Not only must you treat him special, you can't even give that impression to anybody else, whether he found offense in it or not. 
He should, and by the way, this is, this is teaching us, you treat him like you would treat anybody else. This would be, it's not wrong to frown, but if you, it's wrong to frown in front of someone who can see you, it's just as wrong to frown in front of someone who can't see you. Anja'ahu lahma. You can't be making fun of deaf people and say, oh, it's okay, they don't hear it. They, they can't hear me, it's okay. They don't mind. It's not like they heard it. <laughs> you can't do that. So now, after this acknowledgement of Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, by the way, what an incredible passage to acknowledge his, I mean, before this day, when somebody called him blind, it would be an insult. And now it's become an accolade for him. Something that makes him noble. Allah took the most noble human being, the busiest human being, and the human being with the most important mission ever given, sallallahu alayhi wa and said, you should have special care for him. Can you imagine? This entire ummah has special consideration for Rasulullah, and Rasulullah is told to have special consideration for Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. Look at that. Just on account of the effort he made. But on the other side, you know, when, when somebody, this is, a, this is true about a lot of people that suffer from disability or have that kind of a life, they don't have access in society that, like the rest of us, so they don't, they're not part of social gatherings like the rest of us. They're not in part of normal conversations. People act strange around them. They don't talk normally around them. People who know them do, but if they're in a new gathering, people keep staring at their, you know, their missing hand, or their skin disorder, or their eyes going the other way, or whatever. People kind of look at them funny, you know? And therefore, they're not able to have normal social interactions like other people do. These people actually go, have to go out of their way to struggle to get the attention that they deserve. And a lot of times, people like that, you might consider them socially awkward. Like a blind person may be unusually loud. It, it may happen. They're just unusually loud because they need to make their presence known and they don't, they don't know how else. When the Prophet ﷺ is speaking to the leader of Quraysh and he's being interrupted by his cousin, he could tell his cousin, listen, we're family, you have access to me, you can come any other time. And he's not saying that either, but at least he might even be thinking, you and I might even be thinking, you know, you could just wait a little bit. I mean, I know you can't see, but you can hear. You know I'm in a different conversation. But Allah Azza wa Jal says, you have to acknowledge his excitement. وَمَا يُدْرِكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ أَوْ فَتَنْفَعُهُ الذِّكْرَ what clue do you have? You have no way of knowing. Maybe he came to you because he really wants to become a better person. He wants to cleanse himself. And if he's not ready to transform himself right away, at the very least, what you tell him will be a reminder. And that reminder might benefit him down the road. Maybe he doesn't change right away. Maybe he'll take the reminder now and maybe later on he'll benefit from it. And this, this is his side, like Allah comes to his defense. You don't know, maybe he came for good intentions. Overlook the rudeness. Overlook the, the obnoxiousness. Overlook the dismissal of the other. Just be extra courteous to him anyway. That's what Allah is telling the Prophet. Now what about the leader? What about him? Because if you're going to give him benefit of the doubt, you should give the leader benefit of the doubt. Allah says, أَمَّا مَنِ as, the, as for the one who in his heart feels like he has no need for your message. Istighna is, a, is, a, is an analysis of what goes inside a person. Istighna is not on the outside. Istighna, the Arabic word, is on the inside. The man who feels like he has no need. How would the Prophet know the man has no need? He was paying attention to the Prophet. He was actually having a conversation with him. Allah says, let me diagnose his heart for you. He's got nothing going on in there. He has no care for your message. He's just stringing you along. And for him, you are going to keep going back and back, back to him and back to him and back to him and relentlessly pursuing him. Don't do that. He doesn't deserve it. Now Allah spoke about two individuals, didn't he? He spoke about Abdullah and he spoke about that leader. And when he spoke about Abdullah, he called him Al-A'ma, the blind one, like Allah knows him. And the leader, Allah said, someone, man istaghna. As for somebody who acts like they don't, they don't, they don't care, you know, like Allah made him a nobody. Allah made the governor a nobody. And even though Allah has already mentioned Abdullah, He mentioned him again. How did He do so? وَأَمَّا مَنْ جَاءَكَ يَسْعَى وَهُوَ يَخْشَى فَأَنْتَ عَنْهُ تَلَحَى And as for the one who came to you running, He came to you running. And He's full of fear while He comes to you running. The fact that He came from a long distance, the fact that it took Him a lot of effort to get there, got acknowledged by Allah. There's an effort involved. And in it Allah acknowledges the efforts of all those who try to learn something about the deen, especially those that struggle despite their disability to learn something about their deen. 
those who go through extra difficulty to even get out of bed to make it to a Friday prayer. You know, those that are going through pain, internal pain, physical pain, you know, bodily defects, whatever they're going through, and yet despite all of that, they're trying to learn Allah's deen. Those people have been acknowledged in Amma man ja'aka yasa'a. And then Allah stamps the approval of what goes on inside his heart and says, Wa huwa yakhsha. And he in fact is the one that's fearful. The last thing I want to share with you here is yet again an accolade given to this, this individual. In the surah before this one, this is surah Abasa. In the surah before this one, Allah described Musa went to the Pharaoh. Musa went to Fir'aun. And Fir'aun was, do, he did two, he was asked for one thing. وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَى رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَى I might guide you to your master, maybe you'll be afraid. Maybe you'll become a person of khashya. But instead of becoming a person of khashya, ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى Later on, he started running the other way. He planned against the Prophet, uh, Prophet Musa, turned his back and made efforts against the deen. So there are two verbs there. He was supposed to be fearful and tragically, he made efforts against the deen. And the opposite of that is Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum who runs towards the Prophet and and he's fearful. In other words, one of the most powerful political leaders in human history, Fir'aun, is a nobody to Allah and the success story to Allah is this blind man who came to the Prophet this is, I, I wanted to share this with you because in our community, maybe even in our families, sometimes people with disability are the object of ridicule, they are the object of, of very mean commentary, they are put down a lot, they're told nobody's gonna marry you, oh my God, what did I do that Allah punished me with you? Why did I have this disabled child? What I have this, this or that or the other? There are these kinds of things that are heard by people with disabilities. And the rest of us even treat them like, oh subhanAllah, it's a test from Allah, it's okay, have sabr. Like we make them feel like something is wrong with them all the time. Quran is teaching a completely different picture. Quran is teaching us that these are VIPs of Allah. These are important people to Allah. And those of them that are believers and are struggling to learn, even if they may become socially awkward, irritable, that may be the case. Overlook all of that. If your messenger is told to overlook all of it, then who are you and I? And who, who in the world are you and I? May Allah Azza wa Jal give us the kind of sensitivity we're supposed to carry that Allah's book teaches and truly make us live the legacy of our dear messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم على آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا